Muchísimas gracias a todos y bienvenidos a la sesión. And welcome to this session covering the evaluation of uh, performance in uh, the infrastructure projects. And I think one of the key responsibilities, well, that we have, for example, at the uh, multilateral bank is to uh, evaluate the best use of public resources to see how they are looking at uh, levels, le levels of efficiency as well as accountability. And we have with us we're looking at uh, comparative analysis of um, the performance of PPP projects and traditional public works projects. We have various uh, speakers we're with and panelists. We're going to be looking at uh, starting off with uh, Jose Nepa, who is from the University of the Pacific, and he has um, prepared this um, PPP network presentation. Then we will have a discussion looking at uh, public sector investments in uh, infrastructure development projects. We're going to look at some of the best practices in the process, the development in aimed at uh, strengthening the uh, performance uh, evaluation and analyses. We are fortunate to have among our panelists, uh, Fernando Marcato, Secretariat uh, for Mobility and Infrastructure in Minas Gerais, Brazil. Then we also have Facundo Salinas from the Ministry of Finance of Paraguay, Fernandez Ruiz Nunez, who is an economist uh, from the World Bank on uh, PPPs, infrastructure, finance, and guarantees. And we have Thomas Serebeski from the IDB in economic and energy development. So we'll start now with Jose Luis, and then we will have our discussion with our panelists. Go ahead, uh, Jose Luis. Well, thank you. And I just want to share my screen. Sorry. If everyone can, can see the screen, great. So first of all, I'd like to thank the IDB, the, A, the APP, the PPP department, Ancor Suarez, I'd like to thank him as well for all of the valuable efforts and Olga Alvarez for this um, effort that was conducted throughout uh, the year 2020. So the purpose and objective of this effort is to try to establish a comparative analysis of uh, performance levels at the uh, PPP and uh, public works uh, projects levels. So looking at these comparative exercises, one of the challenges is to find uh, good and sound data as well as comparative um, indicators. So it is fairly complex, uh, the infrastructure sector, in order to be able to find uh, the appropriate um, controls and uh, mechanisms. So first of all, the lack of adequate uh, data, when we have a brownfield, for example, you have data before and after the concession. After the concession is not an issue because the concession uh, contract, as well as the regulatory body that um, really it mandates that the concessionaire to present data, but before, when still we're in the level of the, the state, then you may have an issue with uh, data. Now, when we have a green field, you won't have an issue with a concession. Now, before the concession, we're not going to have data available because the infrastructure didn't exist yet. And this leads me to the second problem. I need to compare the green field with other units, similar units whether it has to do with uh, PPPs or public works projects. So we need to have that robustness in terms of our indices and estimations at the local level. Sometimes we conduct international comparisons, but it's better to do it uh, with the national comparative uh, data and to conduct sound comparative um, exercises. It's a look, you have to look at exactly what are the performance indicators, what, do we use an aggregate uh, indicator or not? And what am I measuring in terms of performance? What am I doing in the context of performance? What about the coverage and the quality of services and levels? So in that regard, in this effort, what we have done is that we have placed special emphasis in, for example, uh, 
road construction concessions in the cases of Peru, Chile, and Colombia. So in the first section, we identified the PPP and works, public works projects uh, concepts. We conducted a review of the literature regarding uh, cost overruns, as well as uh, high road accidents and uh, displacement. So we also conduct a theoretical uh, estimate of the um, road project uh, models in the region. So we also conducted a comparative analysis between these countries with the variables that I just pointed out. We also include the vehicular flow, for example, renegotiations, accidents that uh, are addressed with a greater uh, emphasis. And we believe or we've seen that there are few efforts that compare the performance of, for example, concessionary highways as opposed to non-concessionary highways. So we're going to look at this with special emphasis on the Peruvian example. D due to time constraints, we're going to focus on that. And we got mo all of our data on that in that regard. But of course, this can be replicated for other countries without any issues. So we look at the levels of accidents regarding, for example, cost to overruns and uh, over the delays so we're looking at for example of the development of countries uh, healthcare indicators some of the data i wanted to mention is about 50 million people are injured and 3.5 million people are killed in traffic accidents throughout the world which reflects about three percent of gdp costs in um, throughout the countries in the world. So in Latin America and the Caribbean, this reality is very, very present. We have traffic accidents. The, the rate of traffic accidents are double those of industrialized countries. And the victims are about 10,000 killed and 5 million injured. So the traffic accident rates have increased from 14 to 16 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants between 2000 and 2010. So we have a significant issue with regards to traffic accidents. And this is something that we wanted to highlight in this analysis. So getting into the specifics very quickly, I just wanted to explain the contractual uh, differences between uh, PPPs and uh, public works projects. First of all, here we have a concession contract with the PPP, whereas uh, public works projects, we have short-term contracts in terms of construction and uh, maintenance. Second difference, these contracts, these construction and maintenance contracts, the government works with just one entity, which is a government vehicular authority. So it's just one actor, whereas with a PPP, you have the initial construction contract, short-term contract, then you have a second contract covering operations and maintenance if the line ministry doesn't do it directly. So this leads us to believe that there is an alignment in rega with regards to incentives between those constructing and those involved in operations because you're going to have the infrastructure through the vehicular government vehicular authority this does not happen with a ppp because the construction contract is outsourced and the contracts for operation and uh, maintenance that's renewed every five years this is done by another uh, co company that is outsourced so there's no invest there's no incentives for this to be efficient a second difference has to do with uh Funding, the consortium is financing the infrastructure by raising money, raising capital, and the state is paying through um, periodic payments in the future, as well as uh, tolls collected. Whereas with the PPP, the government is uh, funding the debt directly. And then finally, in a the public works project are completely assumed by the government, whereas with the PPP, you have a series of risks that can be transferred to the private sector. 
and I've mentioned this in previous sessions, that there can be construction and funding and various risks that can be transferred. And so the advantage is that it's not a PPP. So here we focus on the alignment between construction as well as operation and maintenance in the context of traffic accidents. So these are some of the initial estimates that we have come up with. Uh, and we present them here. Colombia, in this case, has an, the largest average of investments, about $450 million in comparison with Chile and Peru. This data is interesting. There's an average of cost overruns of 197%. We know that that's a high value and that's attributed to the fact that during the first generation, there, was a, there were a couple of projects that had enormous cost overruns. However, these have been, uh, been reduced. And with the uh, four gen, fourth generation, the cost overruns percentage on average has been um, 66%. So when we talk about the average cost overrun percentage, and we have the amounts here we have in Peru, a cost overruns amounting 133, amounting to 133 million. And if we look at the um, delays, we have 44% on average, uh, 74 months of additional delay. And here we have a an average again of construction delays amounting to 74 additional months and then the percentage of uh, concessions with um, cost overruns as we can see they're very high in the case of peru chile and colombia other data has to do with for example the accident traffic accident rates per million vehicles for Colombia, Peru, Chile from 2015 to 2019. The, the averages here are pretty low for Chile in terms of accidents. When we talk about traffic deaths, Peru is at the top of the list, as we can see here. Here's Colombia followed by very low traffic fatalities in Chile. And then if we get into the specific case of Peru, we have this uh, highway a Peruvian uh, highway before and after the concessions. In very few cases did we receive, get data. We have 16 highway concessions and we only got data before and after uh, on two of these highways. In uh, Chile, we identified 30 and in Colombia, 45 roads. So I think there we can conduct an interesting comparative exercise. What we have here is between 2011 and 2013, this road had, before the uh, concessions, it was a 46.3% uh, of uh, accidents and on average. And here, this has, um, ratio has dropped to where it got to approximately about 30, 30 accidents per million vehicles. So this gives us an idea as to what we can see when we compare a uh, PPP with a public works project. Now, if we look at the methodological uh, focus, we, we've tried to compare highways in the case of uh, Peru, those concession and non-concession. And we've looked at, we've seen two challenges. First of all, the allocation of the concessions follows a pattern deterministic, which is imp impedes the use of impact evaluation uh, tools. Secondly, there's the lack of a baseline to reflect changes in accident rates in the context of a concession, which has limited the use of other methods, such as the uh, differences indicated. So here, we have used propensity score matching, which matches the unique features distinguishing control groups in order to make them more similar to the uh, other group. This technique tries to find similar elements between the control and other group. So using these values, you calculate the probability 
of participation in the program for each treatment and control unit. This participation probability would make it possible to build a fictitious control group statistically comparable to the treatment group. That's the idea. So the first step is to model the probability of being allocated to the treated group. And for this, we uh, use a probit. And based on that, we calculate the average effect of the concession on the treatment group using matching algorithms. If the uh, if this is negative, it would prove the work in hypothesis, which would suggest that um, stretches with no concession with, with concessions have mm, less accidents than those without. And we do the same thing with cost overruns and with uh, missed deadlines. What about the results? We have used data from 2011 to 2019 in terms of the number of traffic accidents, traffic flows, the length of road segments, as you can see on this probe. These are features inherent in the segment analyzed. We have looked at 48 segments of concession roads and 23 of non-concession roads. I must say that Daniel Alabate and Paola Bell have done work for Spain and in Spain, the wealth of data is impressive. We have over 4,000 segments, each one with their booth, with clear information on the tolls, on the traffic, on the accidents, and you can do the econometrics. Here we have truly uh, small bodies of data. And the second part of this graph shows some control variables. The important thing here is that the prediction capability of the probit model is high. Here on the right, we have the distribution of the propensity score, and we see how the controls fit well with the treated groups. And you can also read this in the paper. We have focused on accident rates the number of deaths, the missed deadlines, the cost overruns, and the number of people injured. The negative signs are correct. In some cases, we have a high level of significance, in others not. Some results can be quantified. For instance, if you look at deaths, we have data on the cost of human life in Peru. We have calculated that the cost of accidents is $65.72 million for concession roads in Peru, and it's 254.38 in the case of non-concession roads, which is a significant share of GDP. And these are the cumulative figures. We have also quantified some other things that you can see in the study, but I will try and wrap up. We can conclude that PPP concession roads exhibit lower numbers of injured and deaths than non-concession roads, less cost overruns and less missed deadlines. The cost is $65 million when you look at accidents in the period 2015 to 2019, as opposed to 254 million in non-concession roads. The average construction cost overrun for concession projects is 71.28% and 88% for non-concession roads. And the average of missed deadlines for concession roads is 44%, 22 months, and higher for non-concession roads. The last table deals with policy implications for the region and future considerations. There's a clear correlation between good investment, good maintenance on roads, and a greater or lower, higher or lower level of accidents. So more maintenance or better maintenance leads to less accidents. 
and obviously this has to do with the features of the concession road and of the concession contract and the incentives leading to road security and safety although in peru the requirements for concession and non-concession roads are similar you can see that the concession contract somehow alienates uh, aligns the objectives score matching can also be used for other kinds of infrastructure and certainly this can also apply to chile colombia the countries under review and also to other countries in the region so to sum up it is quite a broad issue you need a lot of data you need to be very careful in terms of the sort of performance you want to measure and this is why we have developed this specific application for roads in peru thank you an excellent presentation Jose Luis. and i will highlight what you mentioned at the end the need for good data in order to be able to do these exhaustive exercises to measure performance comparatively comparatively and there's also the need to increase the body of studies and work available to provide a basis for well-informed policy decisions we see a tendency in the region and i think the 2020 report uh, team headed by Fabrizky um, also focus on the importance of services which also requires indicators to measure performance uh, as regards the user no better reflection of quality for a road than the kind of safety it offers and for the maintenance to be adequate and reflecting standards that will ensure lower levels of accidentality and it's important to look at these comparative studies because we can thus become aware of what consequences may arise if you don't take maintenance into account in the contracts this often happens you don't allocate costs to infrastructure maintenance and this leads to much higher costs uh, for example rehabilitation and that's the experience in peru so there's seven times more spent on rehabilitation than if you had built the maintenance component into the contract from the beginning and when we look at studies like the one you presented which by the way yours has an econometric and analytical bias very clearly as compared to others in the network and the level of refinement of our work will reflect the level of resources allocated and we can't overstress the importance of doing thorough exercises and having programs that will provide all the data we need in addition to the analytical tools i would like to start our panel with facundo from the office of public um, works in paraguay and considering your economical analysis and um, value for money analysis what mechanisms do you think are good to ensure follow-up and the expected results of infrastructure projects and how can performance analysis help us improve with a view to future projects and how can we provide an institutional structure for this ongoing learning process well hello uh, to all of the colleagues out there and to the idp and to you anko for this opportunity now getting down to business clearly the way i see it until we come up with something the main methodology to reflect the 
benefits is the traditional good old cost benefit analysis and in fact often even better than value for money but there must definitely be a very rigorous cost benefit study with a focus on demand so as to be able to guarantee good results secondly and clearly value for money although as we all know value for money depends a lot on the data and the quality of the data in latin america we don't always have the best data and people uh, may often squeeze the data torture them until they give you the results you want uh, and typically what happens in the case of value for money is that you do that once during the preparation phase and then never again and and there's often a reluctance to do this especially when starting the contract negotiations that is always an issue the contracts are usually incomplete per se because of the longer terms and so we should uh, really mm, go back and see if the goals were met or not but I think the way to see how we can preserve the benefits that were originally calculated, I think what we need to ensure is an alignment of incentives in designing the contract. I don't think there's a really mathematical methodology, but it is true that when you look at the world of PPPs and investment, we seem to have a sort of mantra, but we need to flesh this out. It has to do with risk allocation. And we all say that the one who is best at managing risk should bear it. But it seems that these answers don't help much. However, to the extent you as government guarantee in theory risks assumed by the private you will face moral risk issues so i think that in addition to the quantitative qualitative multi-criteria value for money and other methodologies the design of a contract is important because you want to avoid the horsemen of the apocalypse there's moral risk of course and this may happen in renegotiations you start to guarantee things that you originally didn't guarantee but in order to make the project bankable given the passage of time due to the financial closing you start to yield and you may end up leaving the private in a sort of comfort zone and lose efficiency so moral risk is something that should always be taken into consideration we should also avoid information and power asymmetries we all know although governments are strong they're also highly vulnerable due to the very nature of governments they want to inaugurate projects as soon as possible so given that urge they may become a bit lax on some of those pillars and give advantages that shouldn't be there. Well, cost benefit is clear, value for money as well, but we should do that more than once during the life of the contract. Thirdly, we should also use multi-criteria methodology when it comes to strategic and qualitative matters. The environmental side of things is important, the Ecuador principles, but also risk must be adequately distributed to avoid moral risk and uh, information and power asymmetry. That should be included right from the outset in contract design. Very clear, Facundo. Fernanda, you as an infrastructure economist leading the infrastructure development benchmarking initiative at the World Bank, what areas do you identify as the main bottlenecks for proper performance and based on the international experience you're familiar with what can you tell us in comparative terms about 
performance evaluation processes in PPP and the traditional public works projects. Thank you very much, Angkor. Thank you very much for the invitation. And congratulations to the people from Pacifico University for work in an area that we really have uh, very limited knowledge of. So that's a true contribution. And I may repeat what Jose Luis and Facundo have already said regarding the lack of data. What we do at the World Bank is engage in this benchmarking infrastructure development analysis for 2020. We try to compare 140 countries and their adoption of what is regarded as best practices for preparation, execution, and uh, management of projects. When we looked at preparation, interestingly, the regulatory component is still weak, and management appears to show that uh, most countries have good performance in terms of having the regulations to manage contracts, but we fail to implement them. And that's where we find the greatest gap in implementation. The surprise, the way we see it, mainly has to do with the disclosure of performance information, which has a lot to do with this issue we're discussing. If you look around the world, 13% of countries around the world publish information on performance during construction. And that is a very low figure, 16% publish this during the operation phase of infrastructure. We uh, are truly surprised to see those figures. In a way, it's got to do with what Jose Luis said. How can you perform any analysis if you have such limited data? Since most participants here are more interested in Latin America, let me say that Latin America fares and performs rather better than other countries, but there's still great room for improvement. And the second point I would like to mention is related to the fact that, as Paikundo said regarding economic analysis, it would appear that what we find generally is that information is collected. The thing is how to transfer the information in computers of those who work in infrastructure to have information for decision making purposes. We need standardization. And I mean, even within individual countries, not globally. And that should help us improve the analysis, such as the one Jose Luis mentioned. So that is an area where I think there is great room for improvement. The question is, what do we do ex post? It would appear that we're always very good until we get to the financial closing. We do all of the good work, we get the data, but when the time comes, we try to measure ex post, and that is where the greatest shortcomings are. And that's when we would have the data that at the end of the day would allow an analysis like the one performed by Jose Luis or a country. But having the number of roads in Spain, for instance, having all of those segments, having more accurate and specific information as the foundation for our recommendations. And I'll stop here because I know time is short. Thank you, Fernanda. Yes the figures are impressively low, although one could expect that it's still quite shocking. Fernando, the Office of Infrastructure and Mobility, which you are responsible for, what is the role given to the state um, and how does that relate to the situation of uh, private parties and uh, our resources adequate and sufficient. Thank you, Ankor. If you speak agree, I will like speak to ask you Portuguese. Because my Portuguese is not very good. So, 
I would like to say that in the specific case of the state of Minas Gerais, I think it's interesting to bring a, a report about how the state of Minas Gerais. The state of Minas Gerais represents around 10% of the Brazilian GDP and is the second largest it actually is the third largest state in terms of population. In our uh, roads are 26,000 kilometers. State of Minas Gerais, it's, it's around the same size of France. And under our administration, we have 26 kilometers. In the state, and this is a characteristic of the country itself, of Brazil, the states in Brazil, it is a federative state. A country where so each state has certain level of high autonomy, which causes an impact on your finances. So we do have states that are really doing very well, financially speaking, others they are doing very poorly. And this is the case of the state of Minas Gerais. Over six years now, it's the state with the worst financial situation in the country. It, although the situation is uh, improving little by little. So when we talk about uh, decision-making and information about to move forward with a PPP or not, I usually joke that you do a old for money. We say here in Brazil, it's a old no money, meaning the decision, as a matter of fact, is to invest uh, via PPP or do not invest. It seems obvious to those who know the American uh, Latin American reality and know about the, all the historical economic cycles. But that particular topic that I would like to bring about old, no, old money or advantages that we like to refer to here in Brazil to the PPP models. The idea of advantages, we know it started in England with the public sector comparative. But the same dilemmas in English or in the UK are completely different than our reality. Our perspective to opt to do a concession, do a PPP or not, entails by warrant that that road will have over 30 years the necessary investment and will not rely on that very non-linear cycle. And I think also when we talk about the advantage and disadvantage of PPPs, we must, even if it's quali qualitative, take this into consideration. Because if I, for instance, take a photograph of a state that is able to invest, which is not the case of Minas Gerais, can invest with a PPP eventually at that particular moment because he that state is in agreement with, with the IADB that the level, the doubt level will be less and they will have enough money to spend on maintenance. And then the conclusion will be that the public investment is better than the private one. However, when you take into consideration, I'm talking regarding the Brazilian reality in the past, around 2010, 2014, we have the PAC, which is the it was an agreement for accelerated growth. A lot of money coming from the federal state to the federal government to the states and municipalities. Even though with all this uh, financial resource, the execution process was very low because executions of process is huge, that demand is huge. However, the bureaucracy is also as, 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 as large as the other part. So you had enough money, low cost, but it was not spent. So it has become a very expensive money, if you will. So I think that the, we must be cautious when we talk about uh, old for money or comparing different models in I'm referring to Latin America, but I'm specifically referring to Brazil, is this institutional uh, element that is very psychical because we can be, we can fall into a trap. No doubt, I know that if we get a, for instance, a state which is very capable 
to execute in Operation 8, which is the case of United States, that now they are referring to PPPs, but they never need it, as a matter of fact. They have financial resources, a very low, low price, and they were able to execute state-wise and uh, local-wise. But we, in Brazil, we don't have that. So a lot of times, even if the debt uh, cost per state is low, PPP might be a way through. And how the Brazilian legislation uh, worked around this uh, junction. Until 2013, the, the PPP contracts, we, we talk about concession in Brazil where there were no need for public payment, which the common concessions and the PPP requires some level of public payment. Back then in Brazil, you couldn't receive public payment, if you will, in a PPP contract until the infrastructure were available, were ready. What was the result of that? The cost of equity cost of the PPP was always much higher because I needed to finance this private sector, needed to finance that debt in, uh, in uh, installments for a long term. So then we have the new model, which is a financial contribution. I create a, con a concession, a PPP, but I can make the payments for CapEx right in the beginning of the process. So uh, it's almost like a blend between public, uh, public finance resources. Let's say I have money from the IEDB and then rates or, or, or taxes that will be paid later on by the state. I believe and this is something that a lot of multilateral entities are discussing. This type of model is the one that should foment it. A lot of times we notice that some, it happens in Brazil as well with the BNDS. So the financing resources are very tight. So I cannot use that fund and create a blend with a PPP and utilize it. This creates some kind of distortions, the analysis that Professor Jorge Luis was saying in terms of advantage and disadvantage, because I cannot provide this blend. However, if I can do that kind of blend, I can assure you, 99% of our certainty that this will be the best model in Brazil in our reality because the inability of the state has in terms to invest is huge. The financial cycles and political cycles is still uh, affect that ability. So those concessions that could in a minimal level have a higher level in terms of traffic, talking about uh, roads that will justify the concession. Even if I needed a public contribution, financial contribution, I would say most of the time these will be more advantages. And then now just to conclude, uh, referring to what Fernanda just said about the contract executions, then we are talking about the, the, the uh, with the, uh, regulatory framework, which is the terminology that we use here in Brazil. And again, we have some kind of um, synergy. Those roads there are under public administration. They have no regulation, no supervision. The other ones that from the private sector, they do have. So this is the first distortion that we see. And the second problem, what is the level of capacity that the federal government will have to regulate and also supervise all the PPP contracts? And then this is another issue that we could debate, which is how to provide perennial or long-term instruments. When we talk about the regulatory agencies like a solution here in Brazil, it's still occurring that we see almost like those agencies are not being uh, provided with enough human resources or financial resources, which meant that this type of regulations will be really wicked. Here in the state of Minas Gerais, we do not have an entity for, uh, for, for the roads, but my secretary is working really hard in order to create some uh, best practice in terms of regulation. I believe all these um, instruments for contract that supervises paid 
by the private sector, the concessionaire, but supervised by the by the by the federal public authority that you have a supervisor for that specific contract. I still believe this is the best solution. We want to create a, a regulatory agency for transport here in the state of Minas Gerais, but we are completely aware that the creation of that agency is not going to solve the whole problem. It's going to take us two, three years until this agency will be robust and strong. So I think the topic of implementation, we need to think about the more simple mechanisms que puedan Simpler, estar previstos en contratos con recursos garantizados, una tasa de regulación del concesionario puede ser un buen camino para el país. Tiene ejemplos muy positivos, como por ejemplo en San Paulo, Paulo instance, tenemos un sistema más desarrollado of, uh, de regulación, pero hay también otras personas y estados con sistemas regulatorios más frágiles, y entonces se necesita esta reglamentación en Minas Gerais, diría, que es un estado que inició un programa, un programa de concesiones bastante fuerte en el 2004 y hemos visto que perdió fuerza a través del tiempo. Eso ocurrió. Entonces, el ejemplo de Minas que es un, no, no es un buen ejemplo. El buen ejemplo que creó la primera PPP fue un mal ejemplo porque perdió ese ímpetu y esa fuerza. Y ahora se trata de recuperar ese ímpetu con mecanismos más simples. Estas son algunas de mis consideraciones y perspectivas y les agradezco. Well, I think this would, uh, actually this would be uh, uh, enough information for the whole rest of the sessions. But I think just to talk about how we can guarantee long-term mechanisms that will help us uh, look for mechanisms that are more straightforward with guaranteed uh, resources that will ensure sustainability to the evaluation process as well as continuous uh, uh, performance. So with the uh, questions from our fourth panelists as I with the experiences that we have in uh, performance evaluations. And how do you look at the, uh, the current uh, valuation of the sector's uh, performances? And overall, countries conduct a rigorous evaluations that allow to make better de informed decisions. I'd like to know about that. And what are some of the responses? I know it's not 100% positive. So what are the areas that can be improved upon? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. Well, first of all, we need to uh, take a position, a more optimistic uh, position. I know we've seen a lot of improvement over the last few years in terms of the evaluations of infrastructures, for example, the national uh, systems, uh, public and creation of the APP agency, PPP agencies that work uh, assiduously to conduct uh, project evaluations and the multilateral efforts that have been improved upon uh, significantly. The rise of the platforms that help to prepare projects to manage uh, and provide these um, resources. All of these are examples that show clearly that we've made significant progress. But the one cr criticism, and I think this was clearly explained by Fernanda in the evaluation uh, phase of the uh, projects, is it should be followed, should it be following one modality or compared to another? And regarding the feasibility, initial feasibility uh, considerations, I share the opinions from uh, Gaston in his uh, initial comments where he said we still have a long way to go in terms of ex post evaluations of the PPP and we still have a long, long work, a lot of work ahead of us. So now looking at the Isadora's uh, uh, presentation with regards to the specific uh, for example, look, look, specifically looking at the um, contingent uh, liabilities, which is a very important indicator. It shows a lack, a profound lack of evaluation culture. And the worst part about that lack of evaluation culture is it penalizes those who generate the results in many cases. If, for example, we see whether it's happening with the governments and in other institutions, it really, um, penalizes uh, those who bring those uh, results. And then one other comment, 
I think it's important to highlight the lack of ex post valuations. Now, that's not specific. That problem is not specific to the uh, PPPs. It's a systemic problem that affects the entire inf the entire entire infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas, for that comment. Very, very um, valuable uh, input. We still have about uh, 10 minutes left. I know we have many other questions um, and comments. I think we can start off with a very uh, quick round of uh, comments and Q&A for our panelists. And I think that way we'll finish on time. Facundo, to continue with you, how can the government develop mechanisms, just following up on what Fernando was saying, that will allow us to evaluate not just the uh, public uh, sector resources and infrastructure projects, but also the performance levels, ensuring uh, the quality as well as sufficient maintenance levels? Good question. Well, a lot of the discussion is focused on uh, as the colleague said from Minas Gerais, saying that Latin America also, well, in Paraguay, there's a lot of comparison done whether uh, we're going to do this um, over the long term or not. And in the discussion that I had with uh, an American company, the discussion was whether it's going to be done or not. And that reminded me, this, this brought back those memories. So getting back to your question, I think the question is very simple if we really frame it properly. And I think it has two, it's on two levels. First of all, whatever the country we're talking about, we need those who are tasked with developing the project doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be the person involved in monitoring it. That's the first consideration. Secondly, based on my perspective, except for a few mo country models overall, it's the secretariats of our ministries of transportation, with the exception perhaps of the UK, and we'll get out of that context, but overall, it's the ministries of transportation <clears throat> they monitor, and with the classic monitoring mechanisms, in my opinion, those who have to monitor these things in terms of quality standards and risks is the Treasury, the Ministries of Finance and Treasury. They are best positioned, not that we're greater or less, neither one in my case, but we have the incentive the right incentives to try to maintain an oversight of the fiscal risks that can lead to poor performance levels in terms of contracts, especially when we're talking about guarantees, direct or indirect guarantees entered into with uh, treasury ministries. So looking at the efforts, I think the efforts with the ministries of, uh, in, my, in the case of Paraguay, we are looking for establishing checks and balances between the Ministry of Transportation and Public Works and ourselves. They have to do their uh, regular monitoring practices where they monitor the performance levels. But in the specific case of PPP contracts, we have to do two types, two levels of auditing. We have to look at the standards, the quality standards of the services provided in transportation and also fiscal oversight. So I think that's a positive. And then obviously looking at the regulators, the resources, as a colleague from Brazil said, he talked about that some agencies are uh, again, uh, losing resources. How do we deal with the real politic aspects where you reward certain parties. Well, first of all, it would be better and it would be clear that we are, we are clear as to who is going to have oversight and that this is published and that it is mandatory to, um, we're not, I think the transparency mechanisms are essential and make sure that oversight, 
it's not just in the hands of those who are cutting the ribbon when they open up the road, but rather um, evaluations. Uh, we cannot just want and what we already heard several colleagues said that the reality is that it's not just the, the pre-implementation phases. Well, Fernanda, very quickly, based on the study that we looked at today, what are some of the lessons that we can draw in terms of uh, public policies and these uh, analyses? Well, I think that, first of all, I think this shows us that we can do it in countries with uh, reliable and accurate data. Countries that we're looking at here are the most, uh, the, the ones that have achieved the highest levels of maturity and development. How can we extrapolate that to the rest of the region and the rest of the developing countries? So I think that that is something that we need to fully understand. And I think the lesson learned here is that we need to work harder to get good data, sound data, and also when we look at the performance variables, sometimes we wind up doing analyses based on the data that we have instead of what, looking at what we want to measure. How can we define that better? Because what we need to measure ultimately is that have we achieved the gains in efficiency that we were looking for? And I think that is one of the areas where and looking at the third point, which Thomas was talking about, this culture of uh, performance, we need to understand the incentives in order to uh, achieve that uh, performance uh, culture, the ex post measures. With the errors, we can learn lessons that can be applied for the future. I think, and I'll just conclude with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernanda. Hernando, just to finish up with regards to the performance indicators, do you believe, well, the traditional uh, public uh, works, the works projects, can they be improved based on some of the uh, lessons and input that you have seen? I think, Anchor, that they can be utilized regarding, for instance, when you talk about how to simplify basic projects or that we're going to execute. So here in Brazil, there is it's mandatory to have this project in order to have a public uh, uh, project of infrastructure. In PPPs, no. In the Brazilian law, legislation is developing, it's improving to approve some kind of project simplification, uh, given that we will deal with, uh, legally speaking, with this uh, public projects in, in a more sophisticated manner to say dividing the risks and also to amend the contract for any reason. So there is a movement right now in Brazil to try to converge in a way, uh, a better um, simplifying process in projects that are developed by the government for uh, public projects, giving him or her a more flexibility. And the, on the other side, it's necessary that the allocation of risk sharing, risk sharing should also be uh, higher um, for, this, for the private sector, if you will. Otherwise, the incentive uh, in terms of construction will be not determined for the private sector. I believe that this movement in Brazil has already been uh, implemented, and I believe that this must be intensified. Thank you, Fernando. Tomás, just uh, if we could ask you to use your skills in uh, summarizing all of this, what about the role of a continuous evaluation during, before, during, and ex post evaluations? then looking at the looking at the methodological implications as well well in my opinion the starting point is having an evaluation infrastructure of the infrastructure system that includes the development of a comprehensive um, vision you have to have a systemic vision where we identify the needs the country vision and the existing infrastructure and what they seek in the region we don't have the infrastructure plans that are undertaken and developed by institutions that to a certain extent are independent of uh, the executive uh, 
branch, in other words, the current administration. So that's the path that Australia is following with uh, planned infrastructure. Australia or the UK, which was already mentioned earlier, through the uh, National Infrastructure Commission. So I believe that what's interesting with these agencies and with these institutional innovations is that not only do we identify priority projects, but we also see an auditing. They're constantly auditing the performance, the government's performance in projects that they decide to implement and uh, carry forward. But let me just um, share a ref quick reflection. And it was already mentioned here. The evaluations at every level, every step needs uh, to have uh, in, uh, accurate information in terms of uh, all the factors. We talked about uh, today so many, like for example, we talk about artificial intelligence and there's so much, such a saturation of data, but that reality is far from what we're looking at in the infrastructure context, the regulatory bodies, the agencies that have oversight over the providers, they don't have the basic systems of accountability, regulatory accounting that uh, generates this information. In the case of infrastructure, in my opinion, there are too many confidential agreements. One of them, the typical one, has to do with financial structuring. And it seems to be always under this uh, cloak of confidentiality that that, so that denies us the capital cost information, which is basic. And also the, for the regulatory agencies and the public in general needs to have information about the performance levels. I think that's essential. And that's reflected in what Fernando already pointed out about the low, pers uh, low, low amount of information available. We need to make efforts together to generate these instruments to provide uh, public information that will lead to uh, more accurate evaluations. Thank you, Tomas, and I thank Facundo, Fernanda, Jose Luis. I think you've provided um, in inputs that have led to a very uh, enriched discussion. Unfortunately, because of the our time schedule, limited time, we have to move on, but I want to thank all of you for uh, your discussion. And Claudia, I'd like to offer you the floor. Thank you.